non-Christians. The topics have been wide-ranging, either studying from a book of the Bible or on a topic that people wanted to cover, and invariably the topic of baptism has come up. And those who are non-Christians did find out that what we believe about baptism and what they believe about baptism is different. Now some of those people had been baptized with some form of baptism by the denomination that they attended. And so I have been asked the question, why won't you accept my baptism? Now might I suggest that those who are asking this question aren't asking the right question. For it doesn't matter what I think about your baptism. It matters what God thinks about your baptism and what the Bible says is true about your baptism. So the real title of this morning's sermon is, Why Won't God Accept My Baptism? Now to answer this question, we must examine not my opinions on baptism or your opinions on baptism. We must examine what the Bible says about baptism. To begin with, we must recognize that baptism alone does not save us. I feel that many brethren are beginning to believe that the most important thing that a person needs to do in order to be saved is to be baptized. I dislike looking through scriptures and trying to figure out what are the most important things unless God has been explicit on what is most important. For that minimizes different parts of scripture. What is more important? Is it grace or faith? The resurrection of Jesus or repentance? The blood of Christ? Or baptism. In actuality, all of them are important, and one is not more important than the other, because Ephesians 2 verse 8 says that we cannot be saved without God's grace, but the same verse also says that we can't be saved without faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 says that we are saved because Christ rose from the dead, but Acts 2 38 says that we need to repent of our sins in order to be saved. Hebrews 9.14 says that the blood of Christ cleanses us, our, sorry, cleanses our conscience from sin. While 1 Peter 3.21 says that baptism does also now save us. When we try to pit one scripture against another, we're missing the point. There isn't just one thing that saves us. Many things save us. And we must have them all or we won't be saved. In Matthew 23.23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done without leaving the others undone. Now we discussed that verse in detail a few weeks ago, but notice something here. Under the law of Moses, justice, mercy, and faith were all important, for they showed the condition of the heart. But tithing was also important. God desired them to perform the whole law, just as today he desires that we do all that he commanded. So with that in mind, let's examine why God doesn't accept all forms of baptism. For starters, God won't accept, or sorry, for, for starters, when you read the entirety of Scripture, it becomes plainly obvious God won't accept the baptism of someone who doesn't believe. In Mark 16, 16, we read, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus said that one must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Now, why is belief important? Because mere acts of righteousness do not save us. God doesn't desire a ritualistic service to him. He desires that worship come from the heart. 
But that verse in Mark 16 doesn't teach us what we're to believe in. For that, we need other verses. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you would, let's read verses 1 and 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Skipping down to verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. I am not ready to be baptized if I do not believe in the one true God of this universe. The Muslim God, Allah, is not that one true God. Buddha is not the one true God. And neither is Vishnu or Krishna, some of the gods of the Hindus. There is one true God of this universe, and that is the God found in the Bible. But true faith goes beyond a simple belief in God. It requires that we believe that he will reward those who diligently seek him. What does that mean? It means that not only do we have to believe in God, we have to believe God. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The words of God are contained in the Bible, and so are his promises. If we're to have faith in God, we must accept his words as the only truth that we're to follow. What does God's word say? We must believe in Jesus. If you would turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Listen to what the Ethiopian eunuch was commanded to do. Acts 8, verses 36 to 37. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? <coughs> then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The eunuch confessed who Jesus was, the Son of God. There are people out there who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, namely God himself. They might accept that Jesus was a righteous man. They may even accept that he died on a cross, but they deny his deity. The fact of the matter is, the Bible says that Jesus is God, not merely a man. To believe in Jesus, then, we must believe in his deity. We must also believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 3, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You and I cannot pay the price for our own sin and be declared righteous before God. <clears throat> we needed the blood sacrifice of a sinless man, one who lived on this earth like we did, who was tempted like we are, and yet without sin. Jesus was that sacrifice. In dying on the cross for our sins, Jesus paid the debt he could not pay, and opened, self, opened up salvation to mankind. So if we're to believe in Jesus, we must believe that he died on the cross for our sins. We must not only believe that Jesus died, though. As I said yesterday in, in uh, the funeral service for my father, we must also believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We'll deal with that confession part in a little bit. But for now, I'd like to point out that we need to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. We do not serve a dead Savior. He is alive. The fact that he is alive is the basis for our own hope of being raised from the dead as well. If we do not believe in the resurrection, we might as well go home. For if God is not powerful enough to raise Jesus from the dead, he is not powerful enough to raise you or me or any of the other dead as well. We might as well go out and fill up, fulfill all of our desires, for today we live, but tomorrow we may die. 
What a pitiable existence to live without any hope after death. If we don't believe in Jesus and his resurrection, we're not ready to be baptized. And lastly, the scriptures also say that we must believe in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, verses 1 to 4, we find Paul in Ephesus. And when Paul was in Ephesus, he thought he was talking to some disciples, except there was something he noticed. Let's read verses 1 to 4. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, we would not have the scriptures. For it is the Holy Spirit who revealed those words to us. Without the Holy Spirit, Titus 3 verse 5 says that we cannot be regenerated in Christ and renewed unto new life. For it is the Holy Spirit who does those things by revealing to us God's will, which will convict us to obey. Sure, we may not have a complete knowledge about the Holy Spirit or God for that matter. But if we don't believe in God and his promises, we don't believe in Jesus and his death and resurrection. And if we don't believe in the Holy Spirit, we're not ready for baptism yet. Now what happens if I'm baptized as an unbeliever? Then all I've done is gotten wet. Because God won't accept the baptism of, a, of an unbeliever. Now who is usually baptized in this state, you might ask. You might say, well, who's going to be baptized as an unbeliever? Well, those who practice infant baptism. Baptize unbelievers. And I'm not being mean to children. It's that children do not not, do not only not need baptism because they are sinless, but they also do not have the capacity to believe. It is not that they are sinners by some sort of unbelief. It's just they don't have the capacity to believe. Only when children grow up and actually sin themselves and have the capacity to understand who God is and believe in him are they candidates for baptism. So God won't accept the baptism of unbelievers. Second, God won't accept the baptism of, unre of the unrepentant. Simply believing in God is not enough to save me. As we said earlier, we must believe God. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Peter said in Acts 2, 38, repent and, be and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance is a change of heart towards sin, a 180-degree turn, leaving a life of sin behind and walking according to the Spirit, the way that God wants us to live. Paul said in Romans 6, verse 2, How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? God will not accept us in sin, and he will not accept us if we don't change our minds towards sin and live a godly life respecting him and his word. Now, will we sin from time to time? I get this question a lot. If I repent of my sins, but then I sin again later, does that mean I really didn't repent? Well, no. We will sin from time to time, but there is a difference between a true repentant believer and an unrepentant person. And that difference is that the repentant believer will not simply feel sorry for what they've done, they will desire to change their lives so that they don't live in that sin any longer. In other words, they will get up and repent again. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made, sorrow, made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Repentance is necessary in order to be baptized. It is done in our mind before we are baptized, but it is exhibited in our life by how we live after baptism. There should be a difference between our lives before baptism and our lives after baptism. Will this change happen instantly? No. But it will be visible as we grow in Christ. 
When we sin as children of God, we're to repent and ask God for forgiveness, as 1 John 1, 9 says. If, however, we do not repent of our sins, and with that unrepentant heart have been baptized, then God won't accept our baptism, for he won't accept the baptism of the unrepentant. Moving on, he also won't accept the baptism of those who won't confess their faith in Christ before others. Going back to Romans 10, let's again read verse 9, but also add verse 10. Romans 10, beginning at verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Our faith in God is not to be a secret that we keep in our hearts and don't tell anybody about. Our faith should be confessed before others before we are baptized. Now, does the Bible tell us how many others are necessary? Let's go back and reread Acts 8. Let's see if we can figure out if there is this one set number. Let's reread Acts 8, verses 37 and 38. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How many people did the eunuch confess his faith before, before he was baptized? All we read of is Philip. Philip was the one who taught him the word of God, and Philip was the one who baptized him. So even though there was a chariot driver somewhere in that picture, it is safe to say that only one person is required for us to confess our faith to before we are baptized. That means we do not have to wait for an assembly of the church in order to be baptized. In fact, numerous times in the book of Acts, we read of people being baptized outside of the assembly of the church. In Acts 22, 16, we have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Listen to what Ananias said to Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Saul of Tarsus didn't have to wait until the saints in Damascus met on Sunday. He was ready to be baptized then, and so he was. But well, what must we confess? Well, Romans 10 says we're to confess the Lord Jesus. And Acts 8 tells us that confession is our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, I don't believe that there are any magic words that have to be uttered in order for our confession to be genuine. But we must confess our faith in the Lord Jesus as our Savior, and we must confess our belief in who he is. That is the only question that we ask those who want to be baptized, and the reason we ask it is because it's what's found in Scripture. We don't have a creed book that tells you the exact words to say, but we do have Bible examples that we follow. If we're not a confessing, repentant believer in Jesus, and we're not ready to be baptized. And if we're baptized in that state, God won't accept our baptism. For he won't yeah. accept the baptism of those who won't confess his son. Which brings us to our final point this morning. Which is, God won't accept the baptism of one who is baptized in the wrong way, in the wrong way or for the wrong reasons. This point is the most applicable point to those who claim to be Christians today where denominations do not teach either the proper mode of baptism or they teach that they don't teach the proper reason for baptism. Let's go to back let's go back to Acts 8 again. I'd like you to notice how the unit was baptized. Acts chapter 8, let's reread 38 and 39 again. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Notice that there was a going down into the water and a coming up out of the water. Why is that important? Because it tells us that the eunuch was immersed. A little water wasn't sprinkled or poured over his head. He was completely submerged. Now you might say, well, that's just this instance. Maybe that wasn't true of everything. That just, that's just what happened here. Now let's go to John chapter 3. Let's read verses 22 and 23. John chapter 3, 22 and 23. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, 
because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. If John simply sprinkled or poured water over people's heads, he wouldn't have needed much water. A little water would have done the trick. But the argument is settled when you understand what the word baptize means. The word baptize is a transliteration, not a translation of the Greek word baptizo. Now, transliteration means that the word in the Greek was literally, unless we're literation, literally taken from the Greek into the English. It is not a translation of this word. And because it is not a translation, we need to know what the original meaning of the word is in order to understand what baptism is. Baptizo, the Greek word, means to immerse, to submerge, or to be overwhelmed. In other words, fully wet. This definition leaves no room for sprinkling or pouring for baptism. So if people were baptized in this way, they really weren't baptized at all. And thus God won't accept that baptism because the proper action, immersion, was not taken. But even if immersion did take place, and even if the person was a repentant, confessing believer, if the believer didn't understand why they were baptized, or if they were baptized for the wrong reason, or if they were baptized in order to become part of some denomination, that baptism isn't accepted by God either. That's because, again, a person must believe what God tells us in order to be saved. Almost every denomination baptizes as an outward sign of an inward grace, meaning that the person was baptized in order to show others that they were already saved when they were baptized. Now, if that is what the Bible teaches, then that is what we should practice. But that is not what the Bible teaches. In Acts 22, what did verse 16 say about Saul of Tarsus? And now, while you're waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, from this verse, when was Paul's sins washed away? Was it before baptism or after baptism? It was after baptism. Well, that's why Ananias asked, why are you waiting? He was a repentant believer. He should be baptized so that his sins could be washed away. Now, knowing that, when was Paul saved? Was it before baptism or after baptism? Now, this verse doesn't explicitly say, but we can know the answer. It is after baptism. How can we know the answer? because God will not accept us with unforgiven sin. In Romans 6, verses 3 to 11, there we read, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we had been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are not baptized into the death of Christ until we actually have been baptized. We are not raised with Christ until we have actually been baptized. We have not been raised to new life until we have actually been baptized. Or until then, we are slaves to sin. Now let me ask you, can a slave to sin go to heaven. Let's continue reading Romans 6 and skip down to verse 16. Do you, not, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are, the, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that through you, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, 
you became slaves of righteousness. Being a slave of sin leads to death, not heaven. If I was baptized believing that I was already saved, that I wasn't baptized with Christ's baptism, the baptism that remits my sins. Sure, it may look like Christ's baptism, but it's not Christ's baptism. It's another kind of baptism, a baptism that cannot save. If you recall back to those Ephesians who did not know and understand about the Holy Spirit in Acts 19, what did Paul ask them in verse 3? He said, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. John's baptism looked very much like Jesus' baptism. But after the cross, John's baptism wasn't sufficient for salvation, for one had to be baptized with Jesus' baptism. Which was, a, which was the baptism that would be done in order to receive the remission of sins. And what did these men in Acts 19 do? They were baptized again, this time with Christ's baptism. Denominational baptism may look very much like Jesus' baptism, except it is not done for the right reason, and therefore it is not Christ's baptism. Denominational baptism is also wrong for another reason. It is usually done in order to gain admittance into the denomination, and not into Christ. You see, almost all denominations that believe that baptism is not necessary for one to be saved, and is only done in order to show others that one is already saved. And so once, once it is done, you gain admittance into the denomination, like the Baptist Church, or the Presbyterian Church, or the Methodist Church, Pentecostal Church. What does the Bible say when we're baptized? We're not baptized into a denomination. We're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, verses 26 to 29, we read, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. When I was baptized, I was not baptized into some denomination known as the Church of Christ. When I was baptized, I was baptized into Christ, Christ's body, which is Christ's church. I became a Christian, and as such, I joined a local body of Christians who were following Christ. The Baptist church does not follow Christ because they do not believe in baptism for the remission of sins, nor do they follow after other portions of the scriptures. The same could be said the Methodists, the Anglicans, the Catholics, Pentecostals, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and even some local congregations that may have Church of Christ on their side. God wants me to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and He wants me to join myself with other Christians who are doing the same. If I choose to become a member of a denomination, then I've left following God and chosen to follow man. I endanger my soul when I do that, because again, God won't accept me unless I repent of my sins. You see, baptism, again, isn't some ritual that God wants us to mindlessly take part in. It matters how and why we were baptized. And if we weren't baptized for the right reasons or in the proper way, then God won't accept our baptism because God won't accept the baptism of those who don't obey His will as laid out in His Word. So in conclusion, if you weren't baptized according to the Scriptures, it is not us as this local church that won't accept your baptism. It is God who won't accept your baptism. If you want to be right with God, you need to be baptized properly and for the right reasons because He will accept true baptism. If that means you need to be baptized again, then that's what you need to do. For if you don't, you are not being pleasing to God, you are still in your sins and you will be lost if you die in that condition or if Jesus Christ comes first. Why would you want to be cast into hell when you had the opportunity to obey God's word and be baptized for the remission of your sins? I ask all listening today to consider their situation and obey God fully so that you can be saved in the day of judgment. I am not ashamed to own my Lord, nor 